On today's episode of the Law of Tech podcast. There's an important role for CIOs, for uh, innovation managers to change uh, the narrative around innovation as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and legal is special because there's a specific dynamic, of course, right? Where uh, uh, at the end, uh, most of the firms are partner-led firms. Um, so, uh, right, that dynamic is, of course, special for a law space as well. And that those partners are also contributing to revenue as well. So that dynamic is really special for for uh, the legal space, especially for law firms, of course. And that is something that you really need to take into account when talking about innovation. The problem is not that the innovations are not interesting enough. The, 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 ta- the, the problem that we all need to tackle and where we help is that you need to make sure that uh, you uh, manage their dynamic to get return on your investment in innovation and to show that that in- uh, investment is, uh, is interesting enough to start investing. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Law of Tech podcast. My name is Alessa Drukarch, I'm your host, and I'm joined by my wonderful co-host, Mark Mandola. Hi, nice to be here. And for today's episode, we have a Law of Tech special episode with our wonderful partners over at Betty Blocks. We'll be talking about uncovering misconceptions about innovation in legal. And for this, we are joined by Chris Obdam, CEO at Betty Blocks, and Chris Williams, Head of Community Building at Betty Blocks. But before we delve deeper into the topic of this episode, a quick word from our sponsor, Betty Blocks. Are you looking for a way to create solutions that will make legal processes faster, easier, and more efficient? Do you want to offer the best client experience with great digital services? Well, look no further than our sponsor for this episode, Betty Blocks. Rapidly build custom legal tech applications such as legal intake portals, ESG assessments without a single line of code. Start building your own solutions today with Betty Blocks. Welcome to the show, both of you. We are super excited to have you on the show for this special and on a very relevant topic also. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Let me just kick off. Uh, I'm Chris Obdam. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder of uh, Betty Blocks. We're a, a low-code uh, application development platform for uh, business or legal technologists. And uh, we are uh, really active in uh, the wider legal space. So really cool to be uh, a part of this uh, Law of Tech podcast here today. Uh, yeah, a short intro about me personally. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years already. I started when I was a little bit older than 20. So uh, I have quite some experience there. And um, and along the way, I've um, yeah, created the product, which is now Betty Blocks. The legal space has is, is grown to be uh, my home as well. So uh, this is really fun. For me, who has a background as an engineer, to be part of a space which is uh, crowded by uh, by lawyers and other legal people. So, uh, but I really, uh, I really enjoy it, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Quick introduction for myself. Um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm running the com- community at Betty Blocks. Uh, I've been with Betty Blocks for a couple of years now. Um, and my, my kind of past experience comes from um, innovation in the financial sector. Um, and I've, I've really, really enjoyed crossing over to the legal space where there's a really fantastic community of like-minded individuals uh, that are looking all towards a sort of a common goal. Um, and that's been really fantastic for me to to kind of delve into it, learn the industry, learn about the people, meet the people, make friends, uh, and help uh, law firms and legal professionals be more successful with technology and innovation. We'll be talking about innovation in legal and misconceptions around that. And I remember last time we were talking uh, in, in when we were at the uh, Betty Blocks headquarters, uh, we had a bit of a discussion already around this topic. Um, so maybe to gain a little bit of understanding from your perspective, um, what is innovation to you? What does it mean? And what does it mean to the legal space? Uh, so we've been in the legal space for uh, quite some years now. Uh, so I think we have gained a lot of experience about the good, the bad and the ugly uh, there. Uh, and if you would talk about innovation, um, right, it is for us, it is uh, a way to improve the business result of an organization. And I explicitly put it like that, also in light of this uh, wider topic today, because that is what it really should be. Uh, for some people, innovation is about uh, a technology, is it about learning new stuff? Uh, but in a way, innovation is something that have, has driven businesses and organizations for a long period. 
we've come a long way. So mm -hmm. I would put it that in a way, everything that improves uh, something somewhere and maybe based on technology for us in our space uh, is what innovation is. Yeah, maybe to um, to summarize it in a slightly sim in a similar way, um, for me, innovation is also, um, it's people uh, that have got ideas that at how they can move the business forward. Um, and innovation is really putting those ideas into action. Well, it's interesting that you say that because innovation is a word that we hear the whole, like everywhere. Like there's not a day that passes where you don't hear someone talking about innovation. Innovation is so all around that innovation is everything, right? So it becomes meaningless because it's so all around. So everything is innovation. Um, and I think that is why a lot of people yeah. now frame it into, uh, uh, into the real extreme stuff like AI is innovation, right? But uh, you also have process yeah. innovation, right? No technology coming along. But the impact might be twice as high compared to something which is a te technology-based innovation. I think that is also one of the misconceptions nowadays is that innovation uh, should equal revolution. While if you look at uh, what true innovation also is, is a uh, compound interest, right? Also as well, that you have uh, uh, every step, you improve yourself a little bit better. That's also innovation. Um, so innovation doesn't necessarily yeah. uh, uh, does mean to uh, need to be something really big. Because you have experience in legal, right? Um, do you think um, you know how fuzzy lawyers are uh, with definitions? And, and every time, at least uh, from my modex experience, there's always the tendency of putting legal before any uh, special word because innovation is legal innovation because it's special, right? Because by, by default, lawyers uh, want the somehow label uh, of legal innovation. Can you please, uh, in your from your practical experience and point of view, uh, challenge this uh, vision? Or if you think that for real, legal innovation is a very special sector, please shed some light. Yeah, and uh, of course, everybody in legal is listening right now to this podcast. So the answer is yes, legal is very special. And lawyers are the most special breed of people. Fantastic. Uh, and the, answer, <laughs> and, and the, the only true answer is, of course, no, sorry, it's not. Um, and um, there are specifics to it. But if you see how uh, law firms, corporate legal, how everybody in legal space, how they struggle with innovation, it's nothing special. Right? We have experience in healthcare. We have experience in, in insurance, all kinds of different industries as well. Over the years, right? Uh, our, our main focus right now is legal, so we can help to um, uh, to mirror those experience in legal as well. So that means that doing innovation in an organization is hard uh, because everybody has the group of, uh, let's say, uh, 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 lawyers or partners who are right the business end of the organization who are just doing stuff. Uh, and if it doesn't connect to your day job, innovation is uh, might sound to people, and I think that is how it's often perceived, as somebody's hobby, right? We have this trend. Somebody is really enthusiastic about it. Okay, it's somebody's hobby, quote unquote, to find out, right? Does it, is it really interesting? And please come back to me with your innovation trend thingies when I can actually do something with it. And I think that is, um, uh, that is the interesting part behind it. And I think that is, there's, there's an important role for CIOs, for uh, innovation managers to change uh, the narrative around innovation as well. Uh, and, uh, and and legal is special because there's a specific dynamic, of course, right? Where uh, uh, at the end, uh, most of the firms are partner-led firms. Um, so, uh, right, that dynamic is, of course, special for a law space as well. And that those partners are also contributing to revenue as well, right? If you look at, uh, let's say, a, a, a different type of organization, you have a C-suite somewhere, you have executives, and those people are just managing people. And a partner is still generating revenue somewhere, most of the time somewhere directly as well. So that dynamic is really special for, for uh, the legal space, especially for law firms, of course. And that is something that you really need to take into account when talking about innovation. And that is where, where Betty Vlox is also specialized in helping innovation leaders to tackle that, right? Because that is a big problem. The problem is not that the innovations are not interesting enough. The, 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 ta the, the problem that we all need to tackle and where we help is that you need to make sure that uh, you uh, manage their dynamic to get return on your investment in innovation and to show that that inv uh, investment is, uh, is interesting enough to start investing. What I also very much liked is how you said, um, you know, when, when 
defining what uh, innovation and legal means we can learn from others. At the beginning of the episode, you mentioned how both you of you are from a different field and how we can learn from each other. Can you maybe touch upon that as well? Maybe this is a good point to to talk about that, like how we can learn from people outside the in, uh, outside of the industry who are now in legal, but also within yeah. legal organizations. You mentioned CIO, others. Like, how does this interaction work? Um, the question is, how do you work together properly and how can you actually learn from each yeah, other? Yeah, no, and, and, and reflecting on how other uh, industries tackle this and, and and having said, of course, that there's no industry who is excelling in this because innovation is just hard and yeah. organizing innovation is even harder, uh, especially if you're bigger than 10 people big uh, as an organization. Um, but I think what what uh, what we in, in legal can learn um, is is also what we see in different industries is making sure that you you tie the goal of your innovation to your company strategy. Uh, and that is where I think is an important uh, topic um, because that doesn't always happen. Right now, AI is a big topic um, and it mainly a big topic because it is being perceived as a threat first, right? And that is one of the strongest drivers. When you feel you're being threatened, mm -hmm. uh, then that means that you all start to move. But I think we can learn from this moment because this AI hype, quite a quote unquote, right? It's it's a little bit uh, maybe a down playing it down there. But uh, if you look at it, the longer phase, uh, uh, what would be interesting is making sure that you know what your company strategy is, because at the end, what we discussed as well, innovation is means to an end. It is a way to create better business um, business outcome. So if you know what the company strategy is, then you can tie it into that. And I think that is where sometimes uh, companies fail is because they see innovation as the goal, right? We want to be an innovation, more innovative company. And it doesn't work like that. So you need to find out, right, what practice area maybe, or uh, uh, how I organize innovation, or how do I want to flip my business model and and how... Um, uh, how strong am I in this, right? How, how, um, how important is that to us? And I think that is, that is where other industries are maybe a little bit more ahead is that they're talking, they're using innovation uh, as means to an end. And I think this whole AI uh, movement at the moment is really helping a lot because it makes a lot of people move, which is interesting. But then again, you should always tie it again to get it to your strategic business uh, objective somewhere. Yeah, so it really is moving and moving in the right direction. That's the distinction between yeah, the two. Yeah, so you need to know what, what the right direction is. And, I, and when we talk to law firms, right, yeah. I, I am not surprised anymore, but I can be surprised again where I talk to a senior partner somewhere and ask, hey, what's, what's the company strategy? Uh, and, and the answer is more revenue, uh, which I like as well as the company, right? So nothing wrong with getting more revenue, getting better results. Uh, but right, it, it, I think it needs to be a little mm -hmm. bit more specific. And that is also something that we can help with. Um, regarding, because we touched it, right? Because Chris Cole said about uh, AI and the hype and this sort of culture around it, uh, which is driven by, uh, let's say, the, the potential threat, which somehow makes sense, both on a commercial, uh, human side and technology, right? But what do you think is uh, the best way to, uh, to cope with uh, the sort of uh, AI hype, which is something that no, not many, I will say, are... Uh, discussing or have the courage to uh, talk to and what's the best way to let's say uh, to improve the discussion in a more um, healthy and reasonable way for me i think it's it literally it starts with education um you know it, it, the hype comes around and everyone starts trying to move forward trying to do something uh, with it but they had not a lot of people have actually taken the time to actually educate themselves about what ai is um and then back to back to Chris's point, right? Is if you if you identify what the what the, the business goals are, then making sure that you're selecting the right AI, taking up the right sort of strategies that is going to actually support that that endeavor, uh, rather than this is what everyone else is doing with AI. We need to do something, and actually that's not going to that's not in line with what you your, you as a business are trying to achieve. Uh, it's more of a reaction to FOMO more than anything else. And, you know, that, that can be a very big risk uh, for any business if, you, if you're going in blind. And it also kind of leads to the whole, you know, the whole discussion that's central to this episode about, episode about misconceptions. Because at the, the heart of it lies education, understanding what is actually possible and what isn't. Um, could you maybe touch upon what right now, if we look at the 
um, well, the state of the art of the technology, state of the art of processes within uh, law firms, uh, within the sector in general. What are the opportunities that we're seeing for uh, for the industry? And what are some of the barriers that you also foresee when innovating in legal? Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, um, I think there's a, there the the opportunities are are endless, and that's of course a stupid answer. But I think if you, everybody would probably agree uh, that uh, the legal space, in terms of innovation, let's say last twenty years, um, has not been the most innovation heavy uh, industry, and um, I think that provides an opportunity and is not a threat uh, because um, you don't have legacy stuff. Uh, flying around or legacy concepts or whatever, uh, because you can uh, start from scratch as well. Um, so I think that is that is just in general uh, a really big opportunity for everyone. Um, and it differs, I think, uh, per partner and also per firm. But one of the most important opportunities that are out there is to really change the um, dynamics and the model of the industry. Everybody talks about uh, billable hours, right? Uh, that is where this industry is about. A lot of people, even partners as well, would love to change that. And I think there's a way to change your model and your relation with your customer. And your customer already expects that. We have done customer research. Chris Williams was also a part of that. And you have spoken to a lot of customers of law firms, right? Corporate legal and others. Uh, and they expect law firms to move. Um, and so that customer relation is the most important thing uh, where this, uh, where in the long term, this will, uh, this will impact. And that is um, also about uh, making use of technology and innovation to do so. So, of course, generative AI is really big, but at the end, um, it is still the same concept, right? So you have a contract needs to be created and you're faster. That's going to be somewhat disruptive here and there, but the real disruption lies in changing the model at the end. So there are some uh, law firms who are a little bit more up on the road who already are changing that. They are changing and using Retive Logs to create new digital products, subscription-based products, which they sell to their customers. And having that customer relation is mm-hmm. quite different than just charging the billable hour. Of course, as a partner and as a firm, you need to make sure that it is not a cannibalizing your, your billable hour, right? Nobody wants to have a, a more happier customer, but you're making less money. And it doesn't need to work like that as well. If you, if you set it up right, it is one plus one makes three, right? Your customer is more happy, so you can make more money. And at the end, that is really important to, uh, to a lot of people in the space, maybe a little bit less in innovation, but at the end, the people who, the innovation people report to, that is important. Right, I think it's okay to acknowledge the fact that uh, legal space is, a, let's say, a capitalistic oriented space uh, where making more money is really important. But I'm from the software industry, right? So who am I to blame, right? This is all about, uh, about building value and whatever. So right at the end, it's all the same. So I would suggest that innovation leaders embrace that concept and make sure that you explain that. I think that is really important. But uh, coming back, I think uh, the, the big impact is going to be at the business model in the long run. I think what a lot of what sometimes the misconception is is that if you generate a service, uh, if you create a service to your yeah. customer and they do can do self service, they won't pick up the phone, right? But that is just pricing. It sounds a bit simplistic, but the customer is probably one hundred percent okay that if you would normally pick up the phone uh, five times a week, at times two hours, right, uh, and have ten hours of billable hour, and that you charge the exact thing for your subscription service your customer will be as happy, probably more happier because they can do it at their own time, at their own convenience. So the misconception is that it's going to cannibalize your your revenue. I think that is just that's just wrong. There might be situations, but then you are able to sell a little bit more in a different end where you normally were not able to to charge your customer for it because of reasons. Right. So but I think it should be that way and it can be that way. I think you raise a very valid point. about the sort of self-service right and yes you'd be billing them on your billable hours but you could also be charging for this self-service uh tool which they can they can sign up on a subscription for instance um and more and more today the people that are the buyers the clients right they want to be empowered um and at the same time they're willing to pay to be empowered um and it's it's right in line with what, what chris is saying because 
yeah, they, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to take home less bacon, right? You, you, you can actually um, develop solutions that are going to empower your clients to do work that your, would take resources from you and still get paid for it. That's music to my ears, especially when I hear about value, uh, which it's even sometimes more important than, you know, a product, at least I, I, from, a, from a customer perspective, right? Uh, just trying to zoom out of what we have done uh, so far or what we discussed so far by touching the uh, importance of definitions around uh, innovation illegal. And then we briefly touched um, about it. Uh, AI and the AI apps, the importance of education, and now we are into value and billable hours. Based on your experience, especially uh, when you talk to clients, law firms in-house, what's the friction, what's the dilemma between short revenues on one hand and the importance to um, invest for the short, medium term for your business, for your firm, and on the other end, allowing yourself uh, for a longer term um, perspective, because as you may know, um, innovation requires time. I mean, the proper one requires time, requires iteration, requires patience. Um, so it, I think there's a bit of a clash in the two way of approaching business. So thanks to your experience, what do you think is the best way or at least the Betty Blocks way? Yeah, I, look, I fully, I fully recognize it. Uh, one of the, one of the things that I've, uh, time and time again seen in or and heard in conversations that I've had um, is that that the law firms and, and legal professionals do tend to have a more short-term view. Uh, and to your point, you know, in, innovation is something that's ongoing. It takes time. It's, it's never really finished. Um, so I think it is, it is it's incredibly important for, for innovation teams um, to make sure that they're not siloed. Um, very often they are siloed, views as, viewed as kind of the black sheep of the firm, um, and it's to actually open up the conversation um, and be more involved in what the, the business's strategic objectives are, um, learn from the partners and stuff, what are their personal aspirations, where are they wanting to go within the firm, um, and through that you're able to link yourself uh, back to what, what is going to be driving success for the people and for the firm. Um, and I think that's one of the easiest ways to get out of this kind of loop of being very short term viewed the whole time. I think that is a that's great, uh, great uh, point you're making there, Chris. Um, what we see is that uh, um, I think that is the quote unquote hobby aspect again. Um, sometimes uh, innovation is being seen as a um, um, not as a hobby, but as a uh, as a trend trend seeker. Right. So sometimes uh, when we talk with innovation departments, they're like, we're investigating uh, what we should do with X and Y trend. Right. And, uh, and, and that sounds like the wrong way around uh, to me. Um, I was talking to an a innovation leader earlier as well. And uh, every innovation leader, I always ask, what's your KPI? Right. How do people measure success and where do they uh, get, where do they judge you upon? And, um, and sometimes people say, right, so uh, uh, partner happiness is a important KPI. Uh, so that means that um, it doesn't really matter if, they're tang if there's tangible business outcome, right? If people just like what you're doing, uh, uh, then it's okay. Um, and we would always uh, try to challenge that. Um, again, making sure that we know what the company strategy is and help to align the innovation department with that because everybody in legal also struggles with Okay, less less budget, right? So everybody is a little bit on their back foot at the moment, uh, waiting out and seeing what's happening to the market at the moment. So uh, when people expected to hire one, two, three people more in, in innovation, it might be paused at the moment. So if you turn that around and, and show the actual outcome instead of tracking trends and everything and doing research on that, just making sure, so where is my... Right? What is the strategy of the company and, and how can I utilize all of the technology to get there? Um, so I think that is the turnaround that is important. You also mentioned defining strategies, uh, that that's something super important to start with before you actually start moving and then you can move according to the strategy that you've created. Can you maybe give some, some concrete uh, um, advice, some concrete points of actions of how, how do you create such a strategy? How do you move in the right direction and how do you prevent innovating? Um, in a sense, what we called at the start of the beginning, innovations that may seem useless uh, or that's being over uh, overdefined as innovation. How, what steps, what advice would you give how to move 
for, further from here? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the the first and foremost is is to to take a step back, right? Understand what exactly your purpose is within within your organization, um, and then to set out a clear strategy, right? To have have hold internal meetings with the people that are going to be those key stakeholders. Understand where where and what it is that they are wanting to achieve. Um, and through that, you can actually set up the right set of steps that are going to allow you to work in unison with them rather than being viewed as, as, as that sort of outlier, right? The, the thing that we know we need but we don't really want because it's going to disrupt our way of working or it's going to change everything too much. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's key to, to, before you start to innovate, understand exactly what needs to be innovated and really understand why. Yeah, and, and it's a practical tip there, maybe. Um, um, so if you're, you're, you're doing that groundwork at the beginning, as, as Chris said, a practical tip might be if you're an innovator, there are so many practice areas out there. So either all of them are demanding stuff, which is hard, or none of them are demanding stuff. And we see both things happening. And, if, um, and I, I would always say that um, as a rule of thumb, um, find the find the uh, the practice area uh, who might be needing your help most. Because in in as a law firm, if you're in a practice area and business is booming, right, it's hard to make it even more booming. So find that uh, quote unquote struggling practice area. Uh, find that little bit more junior partner somewhere who is is working his way up to the stars. Uh, because those people are more eager and are more willing to help uh, um, you as an innovation leader. It's it's somewhat of a practical approach, of course, but it really makes sense to us. And that's where we see help as well, because um, the goals for a partner are most of the time personal goals, because that's how partnerships work. All of them are personal goals. So the personal goal is to go up higher in the chain. So let the innovation people help you with that. I'm a client and I don't want to talk about my problem. Um, I, I, I just ask you to solve that for me because I think we sometimes we have that, that, that discussion around uh, let's frame uh, the problem before jumping to the solution. Uh, as a customer, I don't really want to open the, uh, the cupboard with my problems. I just need a quick, uh, fast solution. Um, what do you recommend to me? Uh, what could we do without touching too much on the problem side? Yeah, so if we're still talking about a partner here, right? Partner who says, well, I, that's I'm very correct. Busy, but yes. I, have, I, have, I have a sm this small, I don't want to open up the whole cupboard. I just have this small, just help them with that, right? Nothing wrong with that. And, and we should refrain from big uh, uh, innovation projects when you're, you're, where you're touching something new in terms of innovation, right? Start with something small uh, because success to that partner might be that you put up one form. It takes you like one day and you put it up online on the website and that partner might be amazed and you're fixing, I don't know, something that feels to him like you invested just two months of work, right? Um, so fix that small thing. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, I think that is, a, that is an interesting, uh, interesting approach always because innovation, right, is about people, as Chris Williams said earlier. And you start with gaining somebody's trust because innovation people, everybody looks at them a little bit like, I don't know if you're really going to help me, not because they mean wrong, because of experiences. So gain trust and fix it. That's the power of micro solutions. So I think I would say this is the Betty Blocks way for sure, as far as I understand. It's really understanding those kind of dynamics um, and not not when when... There's yeah, something, there's a big new shiny tool diving head first in and going for the big solution. It's it, to go back to CLM, you know, if you actually plot out the process, understand the process, which has been the same for the last hundred years, right? Plot out the process, identify which are the biggest pain points in that or the biggest um, bottlenecks in it, and then creating those micro solutions that, that address that. And over time, what you'll do is you will build up a catalog of micro solutions that create your end-to-end -end product but those micro solutions it's very easy to for the person using the tool to feel the impact uh, even though it's a small impact uh, which means that they're going to use the tool and that's what you're going to do over time is you're actually going to drive people to to use whatever you are making and creating um by starting starting small i think the the biggest risk 
to to innovation is trying to do it all in one go. Yeah, I, I, I've heard it countless times of, of when a partner has come to, to an innovation team, they've had this problem, they've wanted this big shiny tool, um, and then innovation has gone, yes, we can do this for you. Um, but a couple of months into them scoping the project, starting the project, they've lost the partner because the partners become focused on client work. But they then build the solution out for them, and then they take it to the partner and say, hey, we built the tool you, you wanted. And the partner looks at it and goes, well, this isn't actually what I wanted. right? So it's, it, by, by doing it in a much smaller, incremental way, you can deliver the results much quicker and keep the attention of the partner. Um, and, and that's ultimately going to help you get that, that buy-in in the long run. Sometimes you need to approach a little bit pra a pragmatical. It also yeah. um, um, depends on the maturity of the innovation uh, within your uh, within your firm as well. So where are they? Some firms uh, have it all a little bit more established, so you know where to go. Some of them are, are still are still finding out how to arrange it and stuff like that. Um, so that means that that you, being a little bit more pragmatical and just finding maybe the right office location, uh, right? Because if you're looking at large law firms, right, they might have in one country difficult different uh, different partners in different locations. You just need to need to find the ones because there's also a dynamic between them, and that is something that you can work with again, right? Because uh, uh, don't fight the system, work with the system. I would say uh, there, and I think yeah. that there are quite interesting stuff that you can do because at the end, there's the, the it's not a problem of demand. I think that might be interesting to uh, to point out as well. So I was doing a customer call with a, a big global law firm. Uh, I do them quite often, a couple a week, and. Um, the, the tendency at the beginning or the the, uh, the vibe was a little bit negative because something was stuck somewhere. Um, and we're all like, yes, law is hard and innovation in, in law is hard. And then we had like a 40 minute conversation and I asked some questions. And then after 40 minutes, what uh, what happened is that somebody was talking about, yeah, but, yeah, but I still hope we can fix this because I have like four or five problems that I would love to fix. And I think I think that would be really important. And then the other one was, yeah, yeah, but I have the same problem as well. So if you start talking about the problem and the opportunity yeah. again, there's just gazillion options, right? It's not a matter of that there's no demand or there's no room or, right, or it doesn't bring enough value. It is just that the dynamics uh, are a little bit odd every now and then. But right, I think it's our job as Betty Blocks to make sure that we work with that because it's not a demand thing. Uh, people want to innovate. Uh, people see opportunities there. It's our job to make sure that we help the organization and the law firm uh, to make them th those ideas become afloat somewhere uh, and that we mm -hmm. start talking about them and that we vet them right as well. Because not every idea is a good idea, but the moment you have that structure better in place, then it becomes a discussion about value again and not about the word innovation, but, but does this help the organization, yes or no? And then you pick the ones that you think are the most uh, valuable. Maybe to add um, one thing, you also mentioned, you know, change and that innovation ultimately will always r r um, results in some sort of change um, and to kind of bring both parties together. At the end of the day, we, we are all human and humans are creatures of habit. Um, so any innovation, no matter what sector you're in, is going to be daunting, is going to have some element of fear to it. Um, but at the same time, is is fear is often what you experience when you're on the cusp of doing something great. I am always like sad to <laughs> think of something else to say. I wish like this was, would be a perfect place to cut the episode yeah. and a dramatic end. <laughs> we should end. just stop now. Yeah, we should just I don't, stop. I don't want to talk anymore. I, don't, I won't talk anymore. <laughs> no, Marco and I had a brief, uh, a brief conversation about how to wrap up the episode um, because last time when we spoke, we, we had a, um, well, a, a little uh, round of uh, if I were to be a genie and would give you three wishes. <laughs> Chris, we uh, <laughs> gave you a great opportunity there. Um, what would your wishes be to change the, uh, well, the legal innovation scene? Um, maybe taking a somewhat different approach here. Um, if you were to look at other industries, and we once again have a genie uh, here, and they are gra or the genie is granting you a wish, uh, both of you one wish, um, if you were to look at specific industries that you've worked together with other than the legal one, what are what is a specific concrete lesson learned that you would take uh, and give the legal sector um, to innovate effectively? 
Yeah, so the first one we already touched upon, and that is making sure that you just don't see it as something special, but make it part of your grand strategy as your of your company, right? Your yeah. right, your goal is to do A or B or to go to A or B. Make sure that it helps you to get there and make it mm -hmm. tangible and, and measurable. Uh, the second bit would also be uh, around uh, experimenting. Um, as Chris Williams said, sometimes we make stuff and innovations too big. Uh, innovations uh, or experiments sounds a bit like, oh, I'm just trying something or whatever, and it's meaningless. Now, experiments is a really strong instrument in innovation. Uh, so you do something uh, based on a specific hypothesis, right? Uh, the hypothesis could be if I provide a piece of the knowledge of the firm available online somewhere about a specific topic, I think that people will be interested in reading that or filling in a survey, right? That is a is an experiment. So you make a first MVP, a minimum viable product, or like the smallest version of a product first. You do that maybe in a week or maybe less even. You put it online, you set a specific period to it and then say, okay, I expect that this should be the outcome. And then you evaluate and then you improve it or you kill the whole concept. And that experiment a bit, I think that is something that that smaller bit, like the micro solutions as well, yeah. that Marco mentioned and Chris as well. I think that is something that 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 we all in the in the legal space can learn from. Yeah. Right? Don't make it too big because then it's also less threatening as well. Because you're talking to a partner, he says, "Oh, I'd love to try this," and then the innovation leader would be, "Yes, let's try that. I'll be back with you in a week and let you know how it went." Right? And it's like, "Oh, a week? Oh, that's cool. Well, let me know." Right? And if everybody gets that vibe, you can be the most innovative uh, law firm out there. I do have quite a colorful um, background in terms of industries I've worked in. Um, one of the ones that I've, I've, I've always loved, and I, I know um, Alex Herity has also been speaking this, about it a lot, is the lessons that you can learn from, from the cooking industry, from being a chef. Uh, and he talks about legal on plus, and you do mise en plus, and it's actually, you know, I, having worked in a, in, a, in a restaurant, and if you don't do that proper preparation, suddenly it comes time to serve, um, and you are running around like a headless chicken. You are, you, it is just so, so difficult to do the work effectively and create the, the, the meal that you had envisioned. Um, and I think there's a lot that can be taken around that when we were talking about early on, you know, doing the proper preparation, understanding the why is behind everything. Um, and maybe something, something else is, is <laughs> I also spent some time working in the construction industry. Um, and if I look at uh, building a house as the same as perhaps building, building a solution, um, you can build your house and it takes time to build everything, to, uh, put everything together, build your whole house. Uh, once it looks like it's finished, you actually walk around that house and you'll find a whole bunch of snags. Little, little things that haven't been done correctly or little things that need these little adjustments. Um, and it's, it, from that, is, it, the, the lesson there is, is even if the project looks finished, there's probably always going to be a little adjustment that's made. Um, you know, five years down the line, what people want from a house has changed. You're going to have to add an extension here, add a swimming pool. You know, you have to be able, uh, willing to constantly develop and don't ever believe that once you've built a solution, it's here, it's finished, it's complete. There's always, always more to be done. The world itself changes all the time. I think some very, very interesting uh, final remarks to, to, for the listeners to take, uh, to take with them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been super formative uh, and uh, as much as possible challenging. Uh, it's, it was our pleasure, guys. And, and for our listeners and friends, if you want to know more about our partnership, uh, between uh, Delop Tech and Betty Blocks. Take a look at our website. There's a specific page uh, under partners. You're going to find more info and stories uh, about what we are doing together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Ryan. you and you're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Law of Tech podcast. If you want to make sure you keep up to date with the show and never miss out on an episode, be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice and follow the Law of Tech on social media. If you enjoyed the show, please give it a rating or review as it helps others discover the show. And don't forget to share it with your network. For now, have a great day and I'll see you in the next episode of the Law of Tech podcast.